Hello, I'm Mr. Johnston, and this is Biology. All right, guys, we're here with section 1.10, and um, this will be on carbohydrates. So currently, what's in vogue to hate? Uh, carbohydrates, when we talk about them, most people are going to just kind of list them as sugars. Uh, and for the most part, there's nothing horrible with that. Uh, when you look at stuff, it, it is that carbohydrates are either actual sugars or they're made of a bunch of sugars. So the base of all carbohydrates, you might as well say, is going to be what we would call simple sugars. That's going to be things like glucose, fructose, uh, stuff that you commonly come in contact with. So this is going to show glucose off to the side here. Uh, glucose is C6H12O6 is its chemical formula. Uh, you'll see that's kind of important because that's partly how we define carbohydrates. So if you're thinking something's a carbohydrate, it always has a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen. Uh, so you'll see that oftentimes written as CH2O in parentheses with an N off to the side because it could be C3H6O3. Uh, in the case of glucose, obviously it's 6, 12, and 6. Uh, it could also go up from there. Occasionally you also see two, it might have a couple less of some of these just because of bonds that form. So things like sucrose is actually going to be uh, C12, H22O11, I believe. So you'll see some minor differences, but it's going to pretty closely follow this 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. So if I give you something and I give you the chemical formula, look to see if it has a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. That's what's going to let you know that this is a carbohydrate. Now the smaller the numbers that we're looking at, uh, the smaller the piece we're looking at, if you will. Because when we talk about all these macromolecules, so 10, 1.10, 11, 12, 13, uh, these guys are going to be what we call polymers. And the idea here is that we're going to take these small sugars and we can put a bunch of them together to make bigger molecules from these smaller sugars. Uh, we would call those complex carbohydrates. If you look at a food level, those are the food level. Food label, you'll see those are going to be the carbohydrates that aren't classified as just sugars. So they're a bit healthier in most people's minds because they're kind of all attached together, so it's at least harder to break them apart in most cases. But as we move on, let's go over this idea. So a monosaccharide is going to be like glucose. All right, That's the smallest piece. So you might see glucose. Uh, another type of monosaccharide that's commonly used is fructose. Uh, there's, whoops, there's galactose. There's others. Uh, but these are the simplest guys. This is the, the simplest version of a carb that you can get. If you go any less than this, it's not a carbohydrate. Uh, in terms of what we see used. And then we can take and we can stick some of these guys together. So we can chemically bond two monosaccharides, just think saccharide sugar, so two of these simple sugars, and that gives us a disaccharide. Di meaning two, mono meaning one. So a disaccharide would be like lactose. Uh, this is sucrose down here. Uh, so that one ultimately is a fructose and a glucose stuck together. That's table sugar. So that'll be a disaccharide. And then we also have polysaccharides, which are going to be what we call polymer, just like a lot of these guys we're going to talk about coming up in the next several sections, uh, whereas the monosaccharide is what we call a monomer. Okay, So it's just kind of like if you're building a Lego castle, the castle is the polymer. The individual Legos, the smallest piece that's still a Lego, is going to be the monomer. And so we're just going to stick a bunch of them together. So down on the bottom here, you'll see this represents a glycogen. This is going to be an example large carbohydrate where each of these circles represents a glucose. And so you can see in the picture above there, you can see this is a glucose, this is a glucose, this is a glucose. Each of these kind of carbon rings, these, these hexagon looking structures, is a glucose. And they just keep being bonded to each other over and over and over again in these long strands. And so you could have potentially thousands of monomers stuck together, and that's how we get a polymer. And then if you want to, if we, so for instance, if it's glucose, this is what we call blood sugar. That's glucose that's in our blood. If we have too much sugar in our blood, we can actually take these individual glucose molecules and add them to this polymer, to glycogen, uh, this molecule that consists of these long strands, and you can make the glycogen molecule bigger. If you need blood sugar, if you've been exercising and not eating, and so you're using your blood sugar, we can actually do the reverse, and we can break apart glycogen, and we can start kind of ripping off these individual glucoses to throw them into the blood. So this process will work both ways where we can kind of take these monosaccharides, the monomers, 
and build polysaccharides out of them and vice versa as our body needs. Beyond this, we can go and talk about some of the examples of carbohydrates that you guys need to be familiar with. So now that we know kind of how in general we build them by kind of taking these monosaccharides, these they're not always, but oftentimes you'll see that they will be in a carbon ring structure. So they'll look like a hexagon or a pentagon. So in other words, they'll have like six points or they'll have oftentimes five points. It depends upon the sugar, but those are two common ones. Uh, and then we'll just kind of bond them together. And as I said, we can do it over and over again to go from a monosaccharide, a single ring, if you will, uh, to many, many, which will be a polysaccharide. So these can be anywhere from three to thousands and thousands. So of the polysaccharides, so all of these guys that we're going to talk about here are going to be polysaccharides, right? So these will be the polymer version, many. And we're going to use these in our bodies. Well, we'll use some of these. Other organisms use some for various purposes. The first two you'll see are glycogen and starch. And the idea here is glycogen is how humans and animals in general uh, tend to store our glucose. So this one's going to be a, an excellent storage mechanism. Not so much long term, um, but it's going to be used especially like in, a, in the short term for things like blood sugar. Uh, you'll see that, that carbohydrates in general don't store energy as efficiently as, as fats do, as lipids. So if you're trying to long term store stuff, it's way, way, way easier to store it as lipids. In general, storing it as a carbohydrate requires about six times more mass. So unless you want to like store all your weight and weigh six times as much, it's a really bad idea. But you do need some of this because one of the fastest, easiest, most accessible ways of getting energy is to use glucose. And so we will use glycogen, which is just a polymer of glucose. We will use this in our liver to store energy and kind of buffer our blood to make sure there's the right amount of glucose so we have access to fast energy. But if we need something that we're figuring, all right, I'm going to use this much later, you would not want to keep it as glycogen. This is not, once again, a good long-term solution. Now plants, however, they'll use starch, which is also a polymer of glucose. So it's going to be also for storage. Uh, it's also going to be storing glucose. This is what you see in things like potatoes. So that's why they'll call them starchy vegetables because they're made of starch. Uh, and it's going to be what they will, like a lot of root vegetables, like carrots and potatoes, that's what they store a lot of their energy as. Now because those are in the ground and they're not like holding them up or something, plants don't necessarily care as much about weight and all that. So many plants will store a decent chunk of their energy as starch versus converting it to fats. We don't normally just see like large amounts of fats. Some plants will have, like with nuts and such, that plants can make oils and other lipids just like we store energy as. Uh, but you will see that a lot of plants will actually prefer starch as their method of storage uh, versus animals which long term prefer lipids. So starch is a common thing, even long term storage, but this will be plants. This is not going to be animals, whereas glycogen is going to be animals. So storage, glycogen animals, storage, starch plants. Now. Other glucose polymers, there's one more at least that we'll cover, uh, will be cellulose. So this once again is going to be glucose, but this is going to be in plants and it's going to be structural. So if you look at plants, this is what they're going to have their cell walls made out of. And so plants kind of surround their cells with this fairly rigid, very durable barrier. Uh, and the purpose of this overall is that plant cells tend to want to swell, water tries to come in. And so if they didn't have something to prevent the plant cell from swelling, it could eventually grow large enough and, and burst. And so what plant cells do is they surround the cells with this cellulose, which is very durable, very strong, and it prevents the cell from swelling up to the point that it bursts. This is also what we would call in our diet, if you're a human, fiber. Because it's so durable and because we lack the proper or enzyme or the proper protein that breaks this down, we can't digest this. So this is why if you eat lettuce, uh, if you eat a lot of vegetables in general, especially green leafy ones, uh, if you were to go out and try to graze like an animal and eat leaves or try to eat grass, you would find that it just passes right through you. You know, we just call that roughage, we call it fiber, whatever you want to say. Um, but it's just going to pass through your system because we can't break it down. And so because our digestive system can't break it down, it just makes the trip. So that's useful in the sense that it helps keep everything moving through your digestive tract. 
uh, so it can ultimately help keep you regular if that's a major concern, which for some people it is. Uh, but it, it doesn't actually serve a nutritional purpose for us beyond perhaps giving us some minerals and vitamins, things that aren't actually going to provide uh, nutrients so much, or energy I guess you'd say, so much as just providing certain small things that we need when we're trying to build stuff like perhaps calcium or magnesium or vitamin B, things like that. So by all means, still eat your roughage and such, just don't expect to be able to live off of lettuce, it won't work. And then lastly, a kind of cool one is chitin. And so this one's made out of a different type of sugar, it actually is one that's noted because it has nitrogen in it. Uh, but this one is going to be what we find in exoskeletons, especially of things like insects. So if you ever like have an insect and you see it's crunchy, like you can crunch the outer shell of it, that crunchy outer shell is the exoskeleton, it's made of chitin. Uh, you'll see crustaceans have where they add some calcium to this to make it more rigid, but even their exoskeletons largely chitin. Uh, some fungi, or most fungi, all fungi, are going to have a chitinous cell wall as well. So this one's a fairly common cell wall material, just like cellulose, um, as well as being an exoskeleton material, but it's just made of a different type of sugar, so it's not the same as cellulose. This is not made out of glucose. But if you see a fly, if you see cicadas, if you see anything like that that's an adult insect typically, that's ultimately what makes it crunchy is that outer layer of chitin. So as we continue, I've got one last slide just talking about some of the other uses we have for carbs. Uh, Two uses that we talk about right now that are kind of a big deal with carbs to living organisms, namely us, is going to be biofuels because we're taking a lot of the plant material that we grow, at least a significant chunk of it, and we are trying to ultimately like distill it just like you'd make alcohol you'd drink in a way, except we're trying to use the ethanol and the stuff we produce uh, in things like cars. We're trying to use it as a fuel source. And so there's a lot of stuff right now as people are trying to figure out what to do because a lot of what we use right now for ethanol is coming from food. And so that's obviously a problem because if you're using it for biofuels, you can't eat that food. Um, but right now they're also working on using stuff like cellulose and some of the stuff that we can't digest, that we can't really benefit from. So right now they are putting a lot of effort into trying to use those parts of plants to ultimately still make these biofuels. So at that point they could use, hopefully as we go on, uh, things more like maybe corn stalks which still have energy, but we're not going to eat corn stalks, uh, use things like that instead of corn cobs. And so that way we would be able to get energy without actually giving up a food source. We're just using a food source more completely, including the non-digestible parts. So this is a current issue and one that could become more significant later on based upon what happens with energy in our world. And the other thing I just figured I'd briefly bring up is you see a lot of people talk a lot about fructose now. Fructose is one half of table sugar. Uh, you'll see that they talk about uh, high fructose corn syrup, which is ultimately just they take glucose and then they mix it with roughly half fructose. So instead of giving you sucrose, which sucrose is, is just, uh, let's write this out here. So sucrose is just one glucose plus one fructose. All right, that's all it is. They're just bonded, so that's what it is. But then with high fructose corn syrup, it's essentially just a mixture that's 50% roughly glucose and 50% roughly fructose. So overall, because when we eat sucrose, we break it apart pretty much first thing, uh, it ends up being about the same thing as sucrose is. It just doesn't come pre-bonded together, it's already pre-busted up. But there's a lot of people that are saying bad stuff about high fructose corn syrup, and a lot of that appears to actually just come back to the fact that fructose is not the best thing for us. Uh, this appears to be, at least for humans, uh, some rough stuff to eat. And what I mean by that is it appears to it appears to cause some side effects that we can have. It's not good as far as weight. It's not good as far as diabetes. Uh, it could be linked to additional stuff, whether it's heart disease, cancer, etc. And so overall it appears to be that while glucose is probably not the worst thing in the world for us, it certainly seems like fructose probably is pretty bad as far as what we get. And it doesn't seem to matter too much where you get it. So trying to avoid refined sugars that contain a lot of sucrose is probably very smart, just like it would be avoiding high fructose corn syrup, which is pretty much the same thing as sucrose or table sugar. So in your diets, I get lots of people that ask me, especially in these chapters, about like you know what's good for you, what's bad for you. Uh, in general, if you can minimize the amount of fructose in your diet, it's probably overall going to be a good thing for your health uh, in general. 
you know, glucose by all means, don't go insane with it, but it appears to be that fructose out of the, the t common table sugar, common high fructose corn syrup, the, the common ways we ingest sugar as we know it, it appears to be that fructose is probably the, the bad guy of the pear uh, when it comes to those situations. So if you are worried about your health, if you're worried about your weight, your best bet is probably to do your best to avoid sugars in general, especially refined sugars like sucrose, uh, but in general just try to avoid fructose. Unfortunately, that's one of the sweeter tasting sugars, so a lot of people like fructose, uh, but we'll just eventually have to cope with that and maybe get some willpower. I hope you enjoyed this podcast, and I'll see you guys next uh, with the podcast over lipids.